Welcome to API Conversations. I'm Marsha Barnhart, API's Chief of Investigations and your host for this Conversations episode. My guest today for this edition of API Conversations is Norio Hayakawa. Norio is a resident of New Mexico and probably best known for his work investigating the anomalous activities in and around the Dulce, New Mexico area. He is a blogger, an activist, and as such, the driving force behind a citizen oversight committee, the Civilian Intelligence Central. Norio, for a very long time, has been looking into the strange world of what we colloquially term UFOs. His research and examinations in this area has taken him on quite a journey. In the beginning, his belief centered on the ET hypothesis. Now, after many years immersed in this field, he has come to see the phenomenon in a much more nebulous light. Our conversation was wide-ranging, and he took great pains to maintain a skeptical approach, but still face head-on the scope of what he feels is more akin to the philosophy embodied in John Keel and Dr. Jacques Vallée's work. Keep an open mind as you listen to the thoughts and reasonings set forth by Norio Hayakawa. I think you'll find our conversation quite engaging. By the way, our show notes include links to Noriel's blog and selected guest appearances on several recent nationally syndicated radio shows. Now, here is my interview with Norio Hayakawa, conducted on January 19th, 2017. Well, first of all, I really appreciate you taking my call and doing the interview with us. I've been trying to get you for a while. You're a pretty interesting man, and you've been involved in some rather enigmatic activities. Um, Of course, you're well known for the Dulce information and um, for your Citizen Oversight Committee, the Civilian Intelligence Central, and the Civilian Intelligence News Service. And I know you've had some some different thoughts and various um, thoughts on the UFO enigma. And so I would like to discuss that with you today, uh, a bit about your background, a bit about your current thoughts on Dolce, um, some of your latest interests, and then some of your latest UFO-related interests. So let's first talk about um, your background. I know you're from Yokohama. I was born and raised in Yokohama, Japan, Actually, I was born in 1944, and when I was growing up, my father used to talk to us, to both my mother and myself, at dinner table quite often when I was growing up, and he used to tell us how he observed a strange object in the summer of 1947, and That was when he was fishing, night fishing, which was his hobby for many, many years. And uh, he had never seen anything like that before in all his fishing, night fishing experiences. And that was one night in the summer of 1947, he's certain, that he saw a strange greenish glowing object maneuvering itself, as it were, slowly over the bay of Yokohama. It was around two or three in the morning. He had full knowledge of astronomical phenomenon because he was an expert in night fishing. He used to see the night skies, you know, practically all the time. But never in his experiences did he ever seen such a sight. And this object slowly maneuvered Uh, for about 40 seconds or so, and he was astounded by it, and uh, that that experience uh, affected me personally because uh, I believed him, 
even though my mother was somehow skeptical about it, I believed him. And that is the background, as far as I'm concerned, why I became interested in flying saucers when I was growing up. And then uh, when I began uh, going to uh, junior high and then later high school years, like in 1961, I became really interested in uh, getting to the bottom of this flying saucer or UFO phenomenon. And um, I joined a lot of organizations back then in 1961, both in Japan and the United States. Uh, he, uh, I corresponded with uh, groups like NICAP, or National Investigations Committee on Area Phenomena and Area Phenomena Research Organization, um, and many other groups. So I, I used to subscribe to those newsletters. Uh, but uh, while living in Japan, I, of course, joined a Japanese version of uh, those organizations. And so I was a tremendous um, buff on UFOs in high school days in 19, early 1960s. So that's basically my background, but in 1964, I had another thing in my life that affected me. That was when I was reading a newspaper while I was going to a college in uh, Tokyo uh, in 1964. One day in April of 1964, I was reading an English language newspaper at the university and uh, lo and behold, there was a headline in the middle of the page, uh, I think page three or four, not the top story, but around page three or four, you know, you get various news reports from other countries and in the middle, there was a headline saying that policeman sees saucers sitting on sand and it was dated from uh, Socorro, New Mexico, which I never heard before. But anyway, the story was that a patrol officer witnessed an oval-shaped object with tripod sitting in the desert just about 300 feet in front of him. And uh, it was a fascinating incident. It, it's still considered, even today, as one of the best uh, investigated incident, even uh, highly... Um, uh, recommended by uh, the Air Force as one of the few that they believe mm -hmm. uh, that something did happen without going into any conclusive uh, conclusion of what it was. But anyway, those, uh, that incident became um, a pivotal point in my uh, UFO research. And, uh, but uh, coincidentally, the following year, 1965, I received a scholarship from a college in New Mexico and uh, in Albuquerque. And so I came to Albuquerque, New Mexico in 1965, um, but uh, my college years were very busy, so I didn't have time enough to uh, check a lot of things. But anyway, that is my background. And uh, since 1965, I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and then later on moved to Phoenix, Arizona, and then finally to Los Angeles in 1982. Uh, and in uh, 1976, on the 200th 200 birthday of the United States, I became a citizen of this great country. And I'm proud to be a citizen of the uh, United States, and uh, um, I'm thankful that, uh, you know, I'm here. But anyway, I live right now in New Mexico, which is my favorite state. Uh, my wife and I moved from Los Angeles, California, to the state of New Mexico in, nine, in uh, 2008, hmm. after retiring. And so we are here in the great and beautiful state of New Mexico since 2008. Mm -hmm. Now, so your father saw um, an unidentified flying object, and I read that your mother did too, and she consequently told you about that. But have you had any uh, sightings of anomalous aerial phenomena? Yes, in fact, I did. In fact, in 1993, 
a group of us were investigating an area in Southern California called the Tejon Ranch. It's uh, uh, located at the foothills of the uh, uh, Tehachapi Mountain Range. And the at the foothills of the Tehachapi Mountain Range was a ranch called Tejon Ranch. And uh, right next to the ranch was a strange facility uh, conducted by Northrop Corporation. And the North Cro Northrop Corporation was testing at that time uh, the radar cross sections in regards to the stealth technology. And so we were just uh, walking around this fence uh, around 11.30 p.m., about five of us, and uh, suddenly, out of nowhere in the sky, we saw about uh, five or six incandescent lights uh, you know, just uh, balls of light, just uh, just like a string, hmm. elongating and, uh, you know, getting shorter and longer and uh, just like accordion, you know, expanding and uh, getting short and so on as the whole thing moved hmm. towards, uh, uh, I would say, Edwards Air Force Base. Huh. But anyway, that experience was uh, one of the few times I, I really didn't know what we were seeing. And uh, I would definitely classify that as uh, unknown, but it could have prosaic explanations uh, because, uh, because uh, later on I found out that uh, the Air Force was testing some kind of a pulse detonation type of engine, um, you know, at places like Area 51 and other locations. Hmm. And so it may be that, but I still don't know for sure. But, uh, you know, the description of string of pearls is not um, to, it's not rare. In fact, there had been uh, several types of uh, witness reports of citizens who did see what appeared to be strings of pearls in the sky, elongating and contracting as they moved uh -huh. in the sky. How large was this object? Could you tell? Well, it was not large. It uh, it was the size of uh, a bright star, you know. So we were looking at five of those lights, just uh, in a straight line, but uh, they were elongating and contracting, just like an accordion, as the whole thing moved hmm. in the sky. So I don't know what it was, uh, though I would say that that sighting that took place in 1993 was one of the couple of times I didn't, I couldn't identify it. And the other one was uh, around 1992 uh, when I was walking on Las Vegas Strip one night and I happened to look at the sky and there were, of course, hundreds and hundreds of people walking in the Las Vegas Strip uh, that night, of course, every night. But uh, I was just looking in the sky and I saw this uh, rectangular object in the sky. And inside the rectangular objects were about uh, 12 to 13 round balls just uh, moving inside the square, you know, in the, in, in the sky, in the rectangle. And... I just didn't know what it was. And uh, so I pointed out to the people that were walking in. Of course, very few people were interested in. Oh, they couldn't care less. Hmm. So, But I, I, I was really surprised at what I was seeing. But to this day, I do not know what it was. Hmm. How did you get uh, into the Dulce, New Mexico investigation, and how did your interest start there? Well, Marsha, in 1990, I took a TV crew from Japan to visit the outer perimeters of Area 51. And uh, then a week later, we visited Dulce, New Mexico, which means uh, sweet in Spanish. The original name of that small town in New Mexico was called Agua Dulce, which means uh, sweet water. But anyway, 
the uh, when the Hikari Apache reservation was created, they changed the name of that community simply to Dulce. But anyway, uh, a week later, after investigating Area 51, the TV crew and I visited Dulce, New Mexico, mainly because of the rumor that there was uh, allegedly an underground base under the Mesa, right next to the town. And with this kind of uh, rumors, uh, we were interested in getting to the place and talking to the people. And uh, we did talk to many. In fact, we interviewed about a dozen people at the Hikaria Apache Reservation in Dulce, New Mexico. And basically, many of them confirmed that they had seen some strange lights quite often over the Archuleta Mountain or Archuleta Mesa. And uh, many of them also even claimed to have seen military jeeps and uh, helicopters uh, flying, you know, in that area, you know. And uh, so we were interviewing all these folks. But then suddenly we were approached by uh, the chief of uh, Dulce. At that time, he was... Um, uh, chief of uh, safety, you know, that uh, he was not uh, the police chief, but he was almost like a police chief. Uh, and his name was Hoyt Velarde, and uh, he detained us for about an hour on the street of uh, Dulce while we were interviewing these local people about their citing reports and so on, you know. But we were uh, uh, questioned by this uh, police uh, and uh, he just took down all our names and information and everything. And at the very end of that uh, short detainment, he took us to the, the police office, the police station over there. And finally he released us, but uh, just before he released us, I asked him if it was true that there is an underground base, alien base, right near here, to which question he reacted to a kind of strange. And he simply said, I don't want to answer that question, which was a, a sort of enig enigmatic answer, not denying nor confirming anything. But that was our experience. But ever since that time, I have been to Dulce many, many times. But even to this day, I can clearly state that there is not a single tangible, solid, irrefutable, physical, nor documentary evidence whatsoever that there is a physical underground base near or next to Dulce. Yet, the rumors continue and the sighting reports continue even to this day. But when it comes to the nitty gritty, I cannot say for sure what was taking place in Dulce, but, uh, you know, my personal opinion is that Dulce is really not about aliens nor uh, UFOs nor underground bases, but Dulce is basically about humans. And what I'm saying is that, that the United States government had created a hazardous environment in that area since around 1967, when the, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission exploded an underground device, a nuclear device, near Dulce in uh, December, of, uh, December of 1967. It was called the Project Gas Buggy, in which the Atomic Energy Commission exploded this uh, device, nuclear device, about a mile and a half underground in the forest, 22 miles south west of Dulce, and uh, and that purpose was ostensibly to ease the flow of natural gas in that area to to circulate this natural gas so people can you know benefit from it. But in this process, there has been contamination of radiation, slow leaks of radiation in that area, and this is one of the reasons why I believe that. There's a high rate of cancer in the Dulce area. And, you know, there's a lot of people 
in Dulce, New Mexico with this problem. And then also there's a problem of uh, fertility among women in there. So th these, uh, uh, these are health issues. And like I said, Dulce may not be anything about aliens or humans, but uh, aliens of, uh, or UFOs, but it's about humans. It's, uh, it, it could be a health issue, but we don't know for sure, though. Well, when you were there, did you experience anomalous activity? I have not experienced any anomalous activity as far as I, I'm concerned over there. And I go there once in a while, even, even these days I visit and talk to people, but I have not seen anything. Uh, the only thing I experienced that was somehow puzzled uh, by it was... In 2009, I held, I'd organized a conference in Dulce, in the Hikari Apache town of Dulce. I organized the first time ever conference called the Dulce Base Fact or Fiction Conference. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, there were about 130 people that came to that conference in that Best Western Hotel in Dulce. And the only thing... I experienced that was kind of strange. Uh, it was a Sunday, March 29, 2009. And around 6 o'clock in the morning, I was sleeping, but I suddenly heard a thunderous roar of helicopter blades above. And so did other folks who were staying at the inn. And I could feel that it was some kind of military uh, helicopter just uh, hovering over the hotel. And some other people went out and saw a military two military helicopters hovering over the hotel where the conference was going to be held, you know, that day. Hmm. Uh, and this is a fact. I have not seen those two helicopters myself because I was still sleepy and I was still in bed. But uh, later on that afternoon during the conference, which was held, there were quite a number of local residents who said early that morning on Sunday, they saw two military helicopters just hovering over the hotel. Hmm. And uh, this is the truth. But I did not see personally those helicopters. I only heard the thunderous roar of these uh, helicopters. Now, you've been to Dulce many times. You've been to the Dulce area, and you've talked to citizens there, and I suspect you've probably gotten to know them pretty well, and they trust you, and you have their confidence. What's your assessment of the multiple tales stretching back generations of what they've experienced in that area? prior probably to even the military being there, yes? Well, there are many, many stories that many residents of Dulce can tell you. Uh, they are personal accounts of witnessing something they couldn't understand, personal accounts of strange lights in the sky, personal accounts of, you know, witnessing even some kind of a creature. Mm-hmm. Uh, some kind of a, even like a Bigfoot stories. In fact, these are not just uh, dreamed up. Uh, I can tell you that many people have told me as well. And that whole area is filled with uh, reports of local uh, Native Americans uh, seeing things like uh, skinwalkers or hearing things like uh, chanting of something when there's no nobody there. Mm -hmm. So that place seems to be filled with people's belief. And there is a very profound cultural and spiritual beliefs uh, of the Native Americans who live there. Uh, but yet, when it comes to the bottom, you know, of things, there's not a single tangible evidence of anything like this. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's all anecdotal. But yet we cannot uh, deny their stories. 
uh, even though it's a story. So I continue to have an open mind of that area. And when I talk to uh, persons like the, the late Gabe Valdez, who was a state patrol officer in that area for many, many years, I share partially some of his interpretations of what was going on in that area. And his interpretation uh, was that the government may have been testing what's known as uh, psyops or psychological operations uh, using some kind of uh, devices to create an illusion of uh, possible extraterrestrial activity by using some kind of a technology, you know, human technology. Uh, but uh, Gabe Valdez insisted that uh, the government was testing uh, remotely controlled platforms, you know, such as UAVs, uh, you know, in those years, uh, and um, even projecting some kind of a, a the, um, image through uh, holographic uh, imagery projections. But yet, it is very difficult for me to completely agree with it. Hmm. Let me ask you this, though, now. Just as with triangular craft, many people now say it's probably just the government with some secret stealth um, technology. But the fact of the matter is that triangular craft have been seen in the sky since the 1800s, and perhaps even before that, it's documented. So to fall back on the idea that it is just a current technology that the military has been trying to um, fly past us, so to speak, all this time just doesn't hold water. Way back in that area's history, prior to the government fiddling around there, wasn't there odd goings on in that area and that tribe and those people who live there have heard it from their people for generations? Can you confirm for me that the people you talked with there in Dulce, prior to the military being there, had anomalous experiences in their tribal area and throughout that region. Exactly. That is true. This is not a new phenomenon. First of all, strange things have been seen throughout history. And this is exactly what uh, even Dr. Jacques Vallée says, that uh, you know people have for ages seen things they could not explain in the sky for ages. And so... Anybody that says, uh, you know, uh, that there's no such a thing as, uh, you know, unexplainable phenomena, aerial phenomena, is wrong. Because if you look at historical documents, people have seen um, strange uh, lights and strange light formations of various shapes throughout history. And I have... Uh, did a lot of research on the Belgium uh, UFO flap, you know, in the 1990s. Uh, there were a lot of sightings of uh, uh, triangular craft uh, in Belgium and so on, and uh, there was even a photo. But uh, there is not even a f credible photo because the most famous triangular craft photo of Belgium flap uh, was determined to be a hoax. You know, the the, the uh, triangular aircraft that had three uh, round lights on each uh, end of the, uh, near the end of each triangle of the corners. But this photo was uh, admitted to be a hoax by a, a youth in uh, Belgium. Uh, so, you know, I I think this triangular craft business is a is a fascinating thing. Yes, the government has various forms of triangular aircraft, uh, if you will, uh, the B two bomber, uh, stealth, and all kinds. In addition to other more recent uh, rumors about triangular aircraft, uh, yes, but. Let's take, for example, the Hudson Valley sightings of the 70s and 80s, where people had seen humongous, humongous triangular craft. 
I'm talking about people's description, such as a mile long, object a mile long or a, or a, a triangular object the size of twice or three times the football field. Now, these are unusual descriptions, yet I have not seen any photographs of these humongous uh, triangular objects. Now, I'm not uh, just uh, uh, saying that photographs is the most important thing, but people talk about flying uh, triangles, uh, and that people have talked about for, for many, many years already. And there's a book such like David Mahler, uh, who wrote a book about triangular UFOs, but yet the bottom line is I have not seen any photographs or video, authentic or credible video footages of any humongous triangular craft. And this leads to another question. Are we seeing a solid object or a projected image or uh, uh, not completely material object, but uh, to the observer, it appeared to be a humongous solid object. Uh, you know, David Mahler wrote a good book on triangular aircraft, you know, but yet there's not a single photo uh, of it. Th this is my question, and this is why I bring the fact that <laughs> UFOs may not be necessarily objects, nor could they be flying. Just like uh, Dr. Jack Malay and John Keel have said many, many times that uh, people may be seeing things and may be given impression that they are seeing things that which are not. Well, um, now let me bring this forward here. Um, I understand where you're getting at, and we, we did um, our first two episodes of our API case files was with David Mahler talking about his triangular UFOs and assessment of the situation. And now as for lights, I think the Phoenix lights, I think there was photographic and video evidence of that, but I think it got poo-pooed. But now let me bring up the latest incident, I would say, where there has been evidence of some sort um, out of Puerto Rico, where the um, military of Puerto Rico in a helicopter trained a uh, video on a ball of light that uh, they followed for about 20 minutes that appeared on forward-looking infrared as an actual object. However, in two ground areas, the um, radar was unable to paint this object. So it is clear that some unknown type of phenomenon is occurring with us that many of our current detection devices are woefully inadequate to explain and measure. Uh, but it would seem, though, that these are actual physical manifestations that have popped into our environment, for lack of a better term. They aren't just mental aberrations. They seem to be physical, but the properties are such that they can pop in and out at will. So I understand where you're going, but I do think that there is data indicating that this phenomenon at times expresses itself in a physical manner. We still don't know what what reality is. No. Uh, so uh, the to the observer, a lot of things appear to be physical, but the, the big question is this, you know, uh, these things are not flying necessarily, as I told you, according to people like uh, Jack Belay, these things suddenly materialize and demater dematerialize at will, but the bottom line is, the vast majority of the world's scientists and astronomers, the main reason they are skeptical about UFOs as definitive evidence of extraterrestrial physical visitation to this Earth. 
The reason is the distance and also the, uh, the conversion of material into a non-material matter when traveling at the speed of light. Initially, I was a tremendous supporter of the ETH, the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Uh, but uh, back in uh, 1978, I started to read the books by John A. Keel, as well as books like uh, by Dr. Jacques Vallée. And uh, I changed my whole outlook on this phenomenon uh, from a nuts and bolts physical phenomenon to, uh, I would say, interdimensional or extra dimensional uh, origin of uh, this phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, because physically, to me, it's unlikely. Now, why should a highly advanced uh, extraterrestrial visit, uh, visitors come every day uh, and uh, abduct, uh, you know, millions of people? <laughs> and why they have to come so many times? For what reason? And you know, you can, uh, you can discuss all of this, but the bottom line is we have no credible, physical, tangible, solid evidence that we have ever been visited by physical extraterrestrial entities in physical extraterrestrial spacecraft of any kind. And that's the bottom line as far as I'm concerned. Yet, mm -hmm. people report seeing these things. People report being abducted by these entities. Mm -hmm. So we cannot take lightly the claims of people who have experiences such as this. That's why I am still continuing on with open-mindedness what this is all about. I've been reading a lot of what you've been posting lately and what you've posted of others, and there are many, many thoughts from many, many people. And one of these thoughts I see being expressed instead of the ET hypothesis is more along the case of demons and angels. Now, that seems to be something that you are kind of skirting around a lot. So can you speak with us about your thoughts in that area? My belief on all of this is very close to Dr. Jacques Vallée and close to, doctor, to uh, people like John A. Keel, who already in 19, late 1970s gave up the ETH and started uh, thinking about that uh, we may be actually talking about magic. And when you talk about magic and instant appearance of things, there's not much difference to a religious belief uh, of people. You know, the so-called alien abduction scenarios basically involve primitive poking of, you know, the body parts with some kind of, a, you know, uh, object. And it's not a sign of uh, highly intelligent uh, civilizations, but rather it's akin to age-old phenomena such as uh, demonolo demonological phenomena, and this is exactly what uh, John Keel has been saying, and of course Dr. Jacques Vallée as well. But it's, uh, it's, it's an activity that is degenerate as far as I'm concerned, and it's not an indication uh, of anything that's highly advanced, uh, only causing uh, fear and uh, physical uh, damage and uh, psychologically uh, damaging people. And so this phenomenon of alien abduction, as well as the entire UFO phenomenon, to me has not produced any uh, peace among the experiences. Uh, and this is the reason why I tend to agree with them that it's a part of the conditioning of our beliefs. Somebody out there, and that's the only way I can explain, somebody out there may be trying to slowly condition us to a certain beliefs for certain purpose. I don't know exact purpose, but it has been a conditioning process. And in my humble opinion, 
this conditioning process has been going on for uh, you know time immemorial, but it has been expanding, especially in this modern age of technology, and especially since after World War II, uh, there has been a kind of a, a more uh, contemporary uh, conditioning of our beliefs. And I associate all of this with the years immediately following World War II, the termination of World War II. And uh, so I associate the year 1947 as a pivotal year. Dr. Jacques Vallée said he thinks this phenomenon has something to do with a type of um, control system, a control system by some entity or some force or some consciousness. But that didn't just start in 47, of course. No, it didn't start exactly in 47, but we're only talking about the speed up in the modern era seemed to have centered around the post-World War situation. In other words, the nuclear age, with the beginning of the nuclear age, which started in 1945, and with it, the arrival of, uh, you know, German scientists and engineers from Germany to the United States, and the beginning of the Black Project programs in the United States, the beginning of the foundation of the NASA program, all of this started around uh, 1945, 46, 47. And when you look at uh, the events that took place, especially in 1947, uh, which includes the uh, the so-called Roswell incident, which includes the so-called establishment of the Air Force, the establishment of the CIA, the establishment of the National Security Act. This all took place around 1947, which to me is uh, more than a coincidence. But, but uh, Norio, Norio. What exactly are you getting at here? What are you saying you believe at this point that phenomenon might be? You don't think that it's extraterrestrial aliens in physical form. So let's go to what your thoughts are currently on what humanity is encountering at this time. Well, uh, like I said, uh, we are being conditioned, it seems to me. We are being conditioned to a belief system that will benefit whoever is going to control us uh, physically in the future, in, in the very near future. We have been conditioned for something that will involve the universal belief in this phenomena. In other words, the belief in extraterrestrial presence will play a major role in possible future scenario that could benefit those forces that will create that situation. But if that force has been working at manipulating um, since, you know, 6,000 years ago at least, why now is there going to be any change in how that manipulative system is going to do something different than what it's been doing for the last 6,000 years? Well, the, there are many things that have not been realized until the modern age. Uh, uh, the, well, it wasn't just the right time, maybe, that uh, all of this may, you know, didn't culminate in some tremendous thing during the Middle Ages. <laughs> because during the Middle Ages, many of the things we know now uh, have not been established. Uh, we're living in a world where uh, there's the tremendous expanse of knowledge uh, going into uh, somehow a climactic uh, type of uh, uh, situation. And the most appropriate time may be approaching whereby some something takes place that will involve the belief Universal belief in alien presence. And that's what I'm saying. Maybe it wasn't time at medieval ages, they didn't have the right conditions. But maybe they are, we are slowly headed towards having a right condition for a universal uh, uh, program by these forces to finally 
uh, establish something they have wanted for a long, long time. Well, in medieval times, the control mechanism that that was interacting was telling people they were demons and or angels. So at that point in time, they had a stronghold on the populace as being either good angels or bad demons. Now, I, I'm still trying to figure out why suddenly um, at this point since 1947, just because we've acquired atomic weaponry, why there's going to be now a hard push by this so-called control system to do something that will result in what you almost make sound like an Armageddon or something of that nature. Well, if you think about it, every year we're coming closer and closer to having the right conditions because look at the internet, look at the spread of knowledge. One news spreads to another country right now almost instantaneously, but a hundred years ago it didn't do it. It didn't, it wasn't that same. So in other words, we now have the right conditions almost to, to establish something or any force that involves the whole entire world. Now, are you talking about the establishment of a central, a central government, a worldwide central government, and that is going to bring about some type of catastrophic or, or enslavement of the people or something? Well, I, I fear that, uh, yes, partially I fear that. And uh, there are a lot of people in this world uh, that uh, fear that we are headed into that direction and the belief in alien presence unites a lot of people. Mm. And a force that will take advantage of the growing belief in the alien presence will benefit this force, which to me is a dark force that is preparing us to that direction. Mm. Now, is that what has prompted some of your activity into this citizen oversight committee to try to dampen some of the um, the power that seems to be coalescing centrally is to hold people accountable? Is that your effort there? Yes, the effort is multifold. The, one of the effort is to make sure that the government uh -huh. of the world, like the government of the United States, will conduct their research and various programs according to uh, uh, what would benefit all of us, not according to uh, what will destroy us. In other words, uh, the reason why I established the Civilian Intelligence News Service is to tell the folks that, that uh, whatever the government does should be mm beneficial to the human beings. And, and unfortunately, right now, uh, especially in the field of military research, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the biggest drawback for many of these projects is the environmental effect it produces uh, while conducting uh, this growing uh, black budget programs. The bl black budget programs are very important, but the biggest drawback is the how to uh, how to uh, solve the waste, the chemical waste, and all kinds of waste material that results that is resulting from this, these type of researches. So this is the one of the reasons I'm interested in all of this is because the citizens should know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, there are groups that benefit from false information, uh, from misinformation, disinformation. The world is filled with uh, misinformation and disinformation, and the world is filled with people who take advantage of the gullibility of a lot of people. And this creates more impetus for the eventual absolute belief in alien presence. And the absolute belief in alien presence, if that's brought about, then what is that going to do that is going to, what, what will that result in? What's the end game here? Well, if there's an absolute belief in alien presence by every single individual in this world, that will be the ultimate situation in which 
a future oppressive force could use in order to create a false unity around this world. A false unity. Yes, false unity. The world is seeking for a unity, a global unity. Now, mm -hmm. you know, we're living in a world which is uh, just unorganized and uh, th th there's, no, uh, there's no leadership around the world. It's unorganized, but uh, I personally believe that there is coming a force that will cleverly use fear and paranoid beliefs of people. And the, these forces could use this kind of a, a belief and a, a, this desire for the world's people to, to unite this world completely. Uh, and the best way to do it is if this environment of total belief in alien physical presence is throughout the world, then that will be the most unique opportunity to uh, create uh, a false uh, global unity. And actually, some people have said this many, many times, many, many years ago, even including people like Kissinger. Okay, so what if human beings across the world are united in their their belief that there are extraterrestrials interacting with us. I mean, I mean, I don't understand how that could bring about the the enslavement of mankind, which is essentially what you're talking about, uniting people under the understanding that there are alien beings existing throughout the universe. I don't understand how that could bring us to our knees. Well, actually, the if a, a false force could use this belief and stage some kind of a global incident, uh, then, uh, you know, people would, would just consider them, this force, as the final uh, help in guiding humanity. In other words, <laughs> you know, a lot of people thought, uh, you know, uh, were deceived by Hitler. Okay, and uh, in the very future, a lot of people could be deceived by some force that could be a hundred times worse than Hitler, or not necessarily just a simple individual, but uh, a, a, a dark force that will control us and create the false uh, belief in us that they are the, they're going to save this earth, and so. The more people that believe in alien presence will accept this force as the real alien, uh, you know, savior of this earth. And what will this force be if they aren't aliens? The, a dark force. What are you? What are you alluding to here? Well, in this world, there have been many, many forces or people who try to dominate this world and enslave people. Yes, and. It hasn't happened in this scale that I fear uh -huh. in the future. In the future, I believe that there could be a scale much larger than the Hitlerian era, you know, that could enslave all of us. And in order to enslave all of us, the first thing they have to do is to, to create a false illusion, you know, and basically this is what I... I like to say, but I just don't like to to uh, describe this uh, phenomenon uh, without uh, going into some kind of religious belief of certain group of people. In other words, a large group of people around the world have hope in the next world, the, the everlasting life. But there are many in this world that have absolute belief that some kind of a mass evacuation of those who believe uh, will take place and will escape the coming enslavement of the earth before that enslavement begins. Um, 
it's, it seems to me that what you're essentially describing is the um, philosophy of the rapture, and those that are left are going to be under a Satan's rule until Jesus Christ comes back and saves everybody. That's essentially the doctrine that you are portraying here. Yeah? It's my thinking that we could, we could really see this uh, phenomenon in the future. You know, who is to say that it's not going to happen? There's a 50-50% chance that this phenomenon, namely the planned evacuation of a lot of people in this world, will take place. Well, after this evacuation takes place, the rest of those who are remaining in this earth will face some kind of a dictatorial uh, uh, situation and enslavement. And actually, there are a lot of people who believe in this. What efforts would prevent this type of dark force enslaving the populace through a false belief that aliens have come to save the world? Well, I would say that the best uh, way to prevent this is if there will be more people uh -huh. who realize that this whole phenomenon is not a physical extraterrestrial phenomenon, but it's rather a demonic phenomenon, which I hate to use the word. I hate to use the word demonic because once you mention the word demonic, you conjure up uh, religious fanaticism, you know, uh, and, but uh, even people like John A. Keel, John A. Keel never professed to be a Christian. Dr. Jacques Vallée never professed to be Christian. Yet, both these two researchers confidently describe this whole UFO phenomenon as akin to demonological phenomena. And coming from these people, I think it's something that we have to consider. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with both of those gentlemen, but I never, I never really knew that they went to the area of demonic. Well, it's similar to that, because I'm not necessarily saying that it's Jesus Christ or God. Uh, I'm just saying that there are people who believe in this. Uh -huh. And yeah. in the, if this situation takes place, it will benefit those who are part of this uh, force that will stage some kind of uh, alternative scenario utilizing the people's belief in such. You know, let me tell you that, uh, that to me, nothing positive has come from a vast majority of those who have experienced, uh, you know, interactions uh, with with the so-called alien entities. In other words, I'm not saying that uh, the whole phenomenon is uh, the cause of, caused by uh, demonic forces, because I believe that there are forces that are benign or benevolent. If you, if you go to any religion in the world, their belief is that in this world there are benevolent forces as well as uh, the malevolent forces. But what we see in this entire UFO phenomenon, to me, is a deception. You know, if it's a deception, a deception does not uh, come from benevolent forces. And uh, so uh, this is the reason why folks like uh, John A. Keel and Dr. Jacques Vallée, uh stress the fact that <laughs> nothing good has ever come from uh, uh, beliefs in UFOs. In fact, uh, you know, that's my position. I can't subscribe to that as a blanket statement. I think, as you had mentioned earlier, there have been, from, from what I've researched, there is a range of good and a range of harmful things that have occurred. And um, so not all have been harmful. Certainly not all have been good. But... That's, again, that's a range of different experiences. Well, in that sense, you're right, because as I mentioned, 
the, the, there are beliefs, and I, I also believe that there are benevolent forces in this world, but uh, there are definitely malevolent forces. And the way to make distinction is very, uh, you know, you need uh, some kind of a discernment. Exactly. Which is very important uh, to me. Yeah. Especially in this world, we don't know which is which no. many times because it's so confusing. And uh, many people are sucked into this, uh, uh, these malevolent forces and even believing that these malevolent forces are benevolent forces. Mm. So, you know, you can say that to anything. Yeah. But, uh, you know, as far as my experience and my experiences with people who with believes in this type of thing, uh, is very negative. Mm. It's very negative, and um, you know that's why I, uh, you know, I, I I like this topic because it affects every one of us, uh, especially we're in living in this uh, information age, and also at the same time a disinformation age as well, a misinformation age, through the means such as internet. There are so many gullible folks that believe in everything. There are so many gullible folks that, you know, are just uh, brainwashed into, uh, uh, you know, aliens and UFOs. And the bottom line here is, Marshall, is that I have been interested in this phenomenon since, you know, around 1961, but I have yet to see any conclusive evidence whatsoever that we are or have ever been visited by any physical extraterrestrial entities in any physical extraterrestrial spacecraft. And, uh, you know, with physical craft coming here, uh, other than uh, instant uh, materialization that's coming from another dimension. And if we're talking about that, then we're going to go back to this UFO phenomenon as a possible, uh, uh, you know, uh, spiritual or uh, religious apparition or uh, uh, the demonic phenomenon or what you, whatever you want to call it. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying, but my thoughts as a researcher are um, that that this is wanting to call something unknown the boogeyman. We just don't have the information to detect and measure and understand what we're seeing. Um, it doesn't make it magic, and it doesn't make it the boogeyman. It just makes it a type of physics that we don't understand yet and scares us. And because it scares us, then we immediately go to dark places. That could be the case, too. But I know recently that the ETH phenomenon has been supplanted by the the devil phenomenon, and I'm seeing that more and more, not to say there isn't credence to it. I'm just saying it seems to be going from one fad thought of something that cannot be explained with known physics to another fad thought of something that cannot be explained by known physics. And uh, it tracks very closely with the biblical writings of um, end times and Armageddon, which don't necessarily track with any other civilization's background, you know, like Buddhists don't think that. They think you're just going to work your way through karmic um, experiences to an enlightenment, which takes you back to all that is, which is what we term God, which is a power we still are incapable of, of making effable. And so I kind of see this recent thing, honestly, Norio, as a fad thought to explain the inexplicable. Well, unfortunately, we, the only tool we have is to study the uh, age-old uh, belief systems of the people around the world. Let's take uh, basically any other groups of uh, religious beliefs without without even including Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, uh, every belief of human seemed to have some kind of a idea that in this world there are, there are entities that we have to be careful about, you know, deceptive, uh, of deceptive nature. So this is not uh, something that's earth-shaking. When it comes to beliefs, yes. Yes, 
But, you know, I can see where a populist could be captive to a malevolent force. But when one dies and releases this mortal coil that is our body, the question is then, is our soul free to go where it would go, or is it forever captive to this same malevolent energy that is working with the human? That's the question that seems to be posed here when you go to demons and angels, as opposed to just your run-of-the-mill extraterrestrial that happens to be popping in here doing some dirty business because he's not enlightened as a being. I think it's just a matter of uh, terminology, the use of terminology that, uh, because basically, uh, you know, the, the, when whenever you, you mention the word demon or soul or heaven or things like that, you associate, one associates with a traditional Judeo-Christian uh, type of uh, beliefs, but you know that it's just a matter of terminology that that's what i'm saying it's uh, everybody and every group has a different use of the word uh-huh hmm. so how would you wrap up then your thoughts on on where you have come to in your research and study of this phenomenon that uh that humans are experiencing that we cannot put our uh, finger on well, my my position is that a lot of thing, lot of uh, incidents that we consider we have considered to be extraterrestrial may not be extraterrestrial, but it could have prosaic explanations. Mm-hmm. And I'm not a big fan at all of things like Roswell or things like the Phoenix incidents or the Hudson Valley incidents or uh, you name it. I'm not a big fan of it because the bottom line is that there's no proof. Mm-hmm. I uh, am very, very skeptical mm-hmm. when it comes to UFOs and aliens and underground bases and you name it. I'm very, very skeptical of all these things, but I'm more interested in why people have to believe in this. Mm. That's my, uh, that's my uh, 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 interest and in how certain agencies could uh-huh. utilize these uh, uh, type of beliefs uh, for their own benefits as well. You know, the CIA may have its own benefits if people believe in certain things. You, you can say the same thing for everything. So uh, my, my point is that so far, uh-huh. so far, even after uh, I have been into this, this thing since 1961, I cannot even state today that I believe in uh, uh, UFOs, no aliens. I cannot state that at all because the only time I will be have a conviction will be if something actually lands physically in front of the White House lawn and uh, is broadcast simultaneously by the world through television or other means, uh, if there is a definitive incident that makes me to believe in UFOs and aliens, that would be it. But it hasn't happened. Yeah, well, for somebody who doesn't like conspiracy theories, the idea that the CIA and and other agencies are involved in messing with people's minds for some nefarious purpose sounds rather conspiratorial. No, because it's a fact that it's, it's written that uh, defense contractors and CIAs and you name it, they all benefit from certain beliefs, uh, and it has been part of the program. In, in other words, uh, for, uh, let's take uh, some defense contractors. There are always uh, people in those uh, uh, groups that specialize in creating cover stories to uh, protect uh, their uh, uh, secret projects uh, and uh, it's been proven that the CIA have benefited uh, from uh, these type of beliefs, and and it's very easy to promote certain beliefs, you know, uh, for their own purpose. So it's very difficult to create a global scale 
conspiracy by, by people. But what you are saying is that you believe there's a conspiracy by some intelligence agencies to foment the idea that um, there are aliens doing things. Well, that will definitely benefit those agencies if more people believe in uh, uh, aliens because, of, uh, because it has created a laughter curtain among a segment of the population to detract attention away from uh, the, what's really happening there in places like uh, Area 51. That's, what yeah, they, that's all I'm saying. Agencies are conspiring to make people think something as opposed to know what's actually going on. There is an effort by them to make people think one thing. Well, I don't think agencies are conspiring. It's just that they are taking, they could be taking advantage of uh, certain beliefs of people. It's common sense. Hmm. All right. Well, I guess we're parsing words. To me, that seems like a conspiracy by agencies to make somebody think one thing instead of uh, look at the truth. A secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. The action of plotting. So if there's collusion and intrigue and machinations and collaboration and plotting for an agency to work at an entire group of people, say Dulce, to make them think that uh, they're seeing flying saucers instead of uh, some secret project. To me, I don't know how you could parse that anywhere other than this agency is conspiring for the populace to think one thing when indeed they know it's a lie. No. No? Okay. No, no, no. I, I really don't believe in conspiracy theories because uh, the conspiracies have existed, uh, you know, from time immemorial. It's uh, any time uh, two or three persons uh, create a situation to cause a damage to another person or groups, that's a conspiracy. So conspiracies is nothing, uh, nothing uh, uh, earth-shaking. It has always existed, but... We're talking about intentionally creating global scale conspiracies. That is uh, something that I, I don't believe is possible. Humans are too disorganized to uh, create global conspiracies. You don't believe in a global conspiracy? I don't think global conspiracies is possible because if there's a global conspiracy, then somebody will always... Uh, uh-huh. Uh, there will always be uh, uh, defectors that will uh, uh, come out because it's impossible to keep a secret uh-huh. okay. for All too right, long. Uh-huh. All right, well, this has been quite the wide-ranging conversation. I found this fascinating. Um, is there anything you'd like to say at the very end? Uh, and we'll wrap this up. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, I just uh, uh, thank you so much, Marcy, for having me uh, on this program and uh I don't want to be dogmatic about anything. That's my final statement, and uh, I'm always open to uh, any other interpretation, and uh, that's why I thank you so much. That was Norio Hayakawa, blogger, researcher, and activist. You can find out more about Norio in our show notes links at apicasefiles.com. I'm Marsha Barnhart, your host for this episode four of API Conversations, which is a spin off of API Case Files. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. The spoken content of API Conversations is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. The theme music for API Conversations is by DJ Spooky and is licensed under Creative Commons. Check out our other API Conversations podcasts, as well as API Case Files at www.apicasefiles.com. Thank you and keep listening.